Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. I'm going to put your names again here on Vim Thoughts, but I don't want to because these are important people that we have on Vim Thoughts today. So instead of me introducing who they are, I'm going to let Dana do it. Well, we have one of my all-time favorite people, and I say that a lot of, about a lot of people, but I am really, really, really serious that's, when that's I so say nice that. It's so nice to say that about me, Dana. No, yeah, about me. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Asan Aranjad is, is the coolest person. I love him so much. You guys can find Thank him on you. my Dynamo channel for Python Tools for Revit. We banter quite a bit. Very, very good friends. And of course, Scott Davidson, both from McNeil. Yeah. He's, he's the associates part. Yeah. <laughs> so Scott, yes. find yourself. Oh. Yeah, that's that's oh my god, that question. Yeah, isn't that a great question? Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. So I I guess I started a long, long time ago as an architect. Yeah. And I've been doing this McNeil thing for what thirty years or something like that. So. Oh my goodness. Been, I know that's what I say. Um, but it's been fun. It's been a fun ride from. Well, it, from it has to be fun if you've been doing it for thirty years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's kind of cool. We started. I mean, I remember when. Oh, you know, the first people that had geometry, had a little geometry kernel came to us and said, can you put this in AutoCAD? And, <laughs> you know, we, this was like, what, 90s. So we started that and, and then it kind of grew into this whole animal and zoo and, and everything. And insects too. Insects and yeah, the yeah. animal thing kind of got out of control. Yeah, yeah it, it's amazing how that gets out of control. Yeah. It's like in, in IT, we come up with the cool little naming schemes and then it gets out of control. And then you're like, why did we even do that? Well, so, so that's kind of what happened, you know, how you, right? So you, the, the, when it first started, you know, and it's in the back room, you always come up with a weird name, right? It's either cities or whatever. And, and, the, and the person, it was two in the morning and then one of the developers was looking at the wall and there was a, a etching of a, a rhinoceros on the wall. And they said, well, why don't we just call it rhinoceros? And that's what we'll do. And, um, and it was just supposed to be a beta platform, just a testing platform. And, and we kind of let it out to a few customers. And, and when we were getting, when we decided it was going to be popular and, and we were about to release it, we came up with all these names, you know, Acu, Acu model or, or solid this or draw that or whatever it was, some serious stuff. And went through this whole thing with all our beta testers. And in the end, it's rhino stuck. They could we wow. couldn't get away from it. Part mm -hmm. of the good, yeah. Part of the yeah. good part is it translates well. Rhinoceros, right. rhinoceros everywhere. Right. Um, and and so yeah. So we were kind of thinking we'd get in trouble for not being very professional. But, but I don't think you could be in trouble for not being professional. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Only in a corporate <laughs> environment where you've got a boss. Who doesn't want to be professional or wants to be professional? Yeah, get in don't, trouble. We don't have that. So. I don't think that. I don't think clients. I think clients like the whims whimsical names now, Ryan yeah, and sure. because we know we know what it is. Yeah. 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 yeah and Grasshopper yeah. kind of fell fell into that the line right. of those names. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the other weird names you come up with that try to be more hip or or with the uh, industry, those names fall flat. Mm. Yeah. I think, anyway. Good. Well, yeah, I, I, we're we got we have what we have. So yeah, you got what like, we got. That's right. We got. We got. <laughs> so. Yeah, mm. yeah. Every time I see a grasshopper, I think of a grasshopper. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. It does, Either it does that or I get grossed out because it's yeah, a big grasshopper. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's parts of the country right now that that are you get to have a lot of them right so yes cicadas are out so cicadas we have cicadas in las vegas i'm in las vegas we've had cicadas every year for as long as i've lived here which is since 74 so it's a long time mm -hmm. and uh we 
when I moved into the house I'm in today, there there's no cicadas. But the house I grew up in, there were cicadas. Like every year, you would see the hmm. the exoskeletons everywhere, and then you'd hear the buzzing of the cicadas every year. So, hmm. but I guess it's really bad back east this year. Yeah. It's that would gross me out if there's trillions of those things. On the water, maybe it's like the birds or something. They must eat them because I haven't seen a single one near my house. You yeah, haven't? I've seen them a lot around and about. Oh, okay. Do you see a lot of, you see a lot of fat birds around? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> there's, 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 like hawks. there's like hawks yeah. near my house. Yeah, they, they're, they're so nice. fat with cicadas, they're, they're walking. The hawks are eating <laughs> their fat birds. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So what are we talking about today? What's what's new? What's exciting? Oh, um, a good a good amount of stuff. Well, yeah. We'll start with one, and then we'll get to the second one, and then we'll get to the third one, and so on and so forth. Um, so I guess one of the things that's new about um, the so I think we we talked about the Rhino inside um, before. We did. Yeah. And we got some Rhino inside at uh, my office now. Nice. Trying to get more of it going. Okay. So we're excited so, with that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the project that Maxine was started about, and correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, about like two, three years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. They started as part of the, the development of Rhino 7, they started um, separating the uh, sort of like components of the big like subsystems in, in Rhino apart from each other, and then putting it back back together in a way that they could be um, sort of like run inside another application and they don't need the Rhino UI necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of like, you know, they pull the front end out, you know, from the detached them from the back end, uh, which was quite a lot of work for, for oh, that, that big of a software. Um, and that resulted in the uh, giving the Rhino 7 the capability that it can run inside another application. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rhino inside was, you know, born from this this kind of effort and it's grown quite a bit since then rhino inside revit is arguably one of its biggest projects but it's um it's under working work in progress in like blender in houdini in a couple of other applications uh there is connections with um um what's his name the correct me um scott the other Tecla, 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 and, yeah. and and um Archicad. Yes. Yeah, Archicad. Uh, Archicad. So the connections to yeah. that too. Not not everything follows the exact architecture of the Rhino inside project, but mm -hmm. still the in the capabilities in Rhino Seven will make that those connections a lot better. Um, another one that's very exciting, especially for web developers or the people that sort of like want to create tools across many offices and you know their organizations and stuff, is that they can run Rhino inside a Python application, a C Python application. Oh which means that you can have a running instance of Rhino as a web server that solves um, your you know, Grasshopper solutions and those kind of stuff. And this was so exciting and that sort of like, you know, uh, Steve and everybody else at, at, at McNeil kind of figured out that we could actually um, create a, a proper, like a web server application around this that they call Rhino Compute. That is mm -hmm. technically a Rhino inside, um, right. but it runs um, Rhino sort of like it has a web server and it provides an API over it very easily. Um, mm. It's all free, obviously, as long as you have an instance of Rhino running. Um, and then um, uh, sort of like you can run Rhino as a web server too and build web tools over it. Wow. Um, but for us at AEC, I think one of the most exciting ones is the Rhino inside Revit project. And once this project started sort of like, you know, uh, getting a little bit more popularity, that's the time about a year and a half ago that I joined McNeil to, to sort of like help out on the Revit side and uh, figure out the Revit challenges and whatnot. So I guess the question that I would have then is where do the other instances of Rhino inside, put your name here, come from? So people request them? Is it is it kind of like all the integrations with Dynamo? People in the community think uh, this is something we want to do. They sort of start the legwork and then and it grows from there. Like technically could it add into anything if there's a, a will to have that? The, it's yeah it's uh, it's open source. So so people grab the source to to figure out how to do it. And then um and then the a lot of the connections like um, Archicad, Graphisoft did that themselves and Tecla, they did it themselves. 
Um, and then there are like in the Blender community, some of the people in the Blender community that are also in the Rhino community did that one. So it just depends um, on, on the, the application. And the, what you need to do to make it easy, it needs to be a Windows application that has a .NET SDK. So if okay. it has a .NET SDK, we can talk to it. If it has another kind of SDK, it gets a little more complicated because you have to wrap it, you know, wrap the yeah. SDK. But yeah. um, not all of them are true inside applications. And so some just communicate through a pipe um, and, and they act like they're inside. But like in the Revit case, this is Rhino actually running in the same memory and Grasshopper running in the same memory space as Revit. Um, so it, it technically is still only one application. Which re really is mind blowing when you think back, you know, five years ago, just to, you know, all the things we had to go through to get a little bit of Rhino geometry inside of Revit was, you know, that was a full-time job. And now yeah. we can just open Rhino in Revit. It yeah. really is uh, mind blowing. Yeah. We were surprised it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it was really just an experiment, you know? I think Kike had Revit on his machine. He thought, well, why don't I give it a try? And, and yeah. lo and behold, yeah. So it, it, it's kind of interesting that the, um, that like when I joined the project and uh, sort of like learn about Rhino inside, I was like, because Scott told me that the main challenge was that they were getting a lot of requests in AEC to bring Rhino models into Revit. And they were like, well, while we're doing that, why not just bring the whole software? So you have access to everything yeah. and the 40 file formats that Rhino can import and, and Grasshopper and all the other kind of stuff. Um, so, so I guess it was that technology that they came, that Autodesk came out with when they started showing the Navisworks models inside of Revit that really got that API or that part working for you. Is that is that the uh, case? No. Or, so, or so is it completely most, different? It's completely different. 90% ah. of the um, what Rhino inside is, is uh -huh. really Rhino that is capable of running inside another application. Um, the rest of it is just coordination and working with the Revit API to provide those specific, what we call them Revit aware components in Grasshopper that they can sort of like uh, deal with Revit content. Like they can generate native walls and native geometry, or they can right. bring Rhino geometry into standardized containers that uh, that Autodesk has. Uh, this is uh. going back to your comment. That's what really what Autodesk provided a direct shape, which is a sort of like an element type in Revit model that can include any custom geometry inside of it. Oh, I see. And so it, they had this, they had this new object that you can that you can exactly. make now. Yeah. And then so you just made an add on that just happened to be Rhino. Yeah, exactly. That so made that, Rhino that, 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 that it, feels, yeah, right. And then it, uh, your your add-on then reads the is Rhino, so it's it's doing whatever the Rhino does best, and then it just makes that new shape. Yeah, at the end. yeah. yeah. there are so, still yeah. challenges in converting that shape into sort of like uh, presenting it into the Revit API, so Revit can, API right. can accept it as a direct shape. But sure. adding that direct shape to uh, Revit's schema and data model was actually super super helpful. Uh, it still gets categorized correctly, so you can call it a direct shape okay. that is a, um, a door or a wall or something like that. So you, it still sits in the correct hierarchy. Uh, it's just that Revit doesn't generate the geometry anymore. The logic of generating that geometry comes from somewhere else. Right. And so you can't edit that geometry in Revit you if you wanted well, to. You, well, it depends, right? I mean, it, it depends. depends how you take it across. <laughs> so if you take it across as, if you create your own families with Grasshopper, uh -huh. and, 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 and insert those types. So component families, and those, those are NURBS objects. You can actually grab those and, and edit them with, with, oh, uh, I see. you can drag them, you know, just very, very simply, you can drag them and scale them. Right. But, because you're not, you're bringing in the family then into your Revit model. You're not bringing yeah. in the Rhino, the Rhino created the Revit family, then the Revit family then goes into the model. And that's right. Revit's exactly. none the wiser. Right. You can also do, you can also like create floors and, and uh, uh -huh. uh, roofs and columns and, and yeah. walls. And those are native Revit objects. So if you disconnect right. Grasshopper from that, you edit it and nobody could tell the difference that that wasn't originally That's gone cool. in Revit. Yeah. Yeah. But once you, once you start editing it, you, 
like what you said, you have to disconnect it. Now you've lost your link. Actually, no. So no? Uh, there, are two, there are two things happening here, which is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, with the direct shape that we talked about, that is okay. sort of like rhino geometry coming inside Revit and gets, getting categorized correctly. Uh -huh. What Scott mentioned, that is, TK, the main developer on the project, he actually was smart enough to, uh, was smart that he modified Rhino inside Revit to work in a way that when you're editing a family, it doesn't necessarily need to bring geometry because family is sort of like an open environment that you can create custom geometry in there. So for whatever geometry that he can actually create it, like if you want to place a box there, he just places an actual Revit box in there. So mm -hmm. it becomes modifiable and changeable mm -hmm. and you can update it and all that kind of stuff. And then you can load this family inside Revit. And then the third one is Grasshopper on top of Rhino, Rhino that has custom components for Revit uh, content. So like there's a component that generates Revit walls using Revit uh -huh. API. There's nothing coming, no oh, okay. coming from Rhino. It's just data that you provide inside Grasshopper to generate, just kind of sort of like kind cool. of like what Dyn Dynamo does, but uh, but Grasshopper. But Grasshopper instead. Yeah. One more question. I'll let you get in, Dana, because I know you're itching to ask a question. Can you take a floor, for example, because you say you can do floors that was generated in Revit, and then take it? using Rhino inside and modify it and do crazy things with it um, as, or great yeah. things with it for that matter. Yeah, as, as far as, so because Revit a floor that we are mentioning is a native Revit element, right. you can modify it as much as Revit allows you to. Okay. So you can't take it and remove the geometry and put something crazy in there, right? Because it's uh -huh. generated by Revit, but you can change its properties. You can change its level. You can change oh, okay. its memory. You can do other stuff as much of it that Revit API allows. And then it's, so it's like kind of inconsistent at the moment, it's getting better. But for example, you can do something, some stuff to walls and floors, but you can't really do much to ceilings. Okay. Um, that is changing as, as, as of like Revit 2022, they're adding more uh, APIs to it. We're starting, you know, uh, adopt those as, as they show up. Yeah, so you can, you can take Revit, any object in Revit that has geometry, you can grab that and, it, and it's in Rhino and Rhino can operate on it as standard geometry, standard Rhino oh, okay. geometry actually. So that that goes that right. direction yeah. too, yeah. Where yeah, you so you could you would just convert that floor to a Rhino object or Rhino whatever Rhino, right? And then right. when Rhino puts it back, it replaces that floor with something that the, is not a floor. Yeah. It's that special geometry. Yeah, that's where you get it gets a little tough with Revit because the, there's certain categories that you can't just put custom geometry in, and uh -huh. floors happen to be one of those things. Oh, okay. Um, so I yeah. picked the hardest one on accident. Well, well second well, hardest one. Ceilings. Walls. Yes, ceilings are tough. Walls. Ceiling. Um, you know, s some of those system families are are tough, and uh -huh. you, and you and so you can. They're very limited. They're not very flexible. You either have to do a direct shape, or you have to you know use what they can do. And so you do get into sometimes you get into having to make families in different categories, that can take crazy shapes. And then SAP categorize that, those uh -huh. objects, you know, so that you have graphic control over them and things like that. Okay. Um, uh, a good example is, is I do a demonstration with a walkway and we put it in the site category because it's, you know, it's, yeah. it's all custom crazy shapes. And, and, uh -huh. and so you have to be a little careful about how you walk around in Revit in terms of, I mean, you know this, in terms of yeah. what you can and can't do in different categories. No. Dana, your turn. That's the benefit, right? <laughs> That's the benefit of, of Rhino and Grasshopper is the robust abilities that you have with geometry, whereas you don't really have those capabilities with, with Dynamo and, and Revit natively, sadly. And I think most of us in the computational world can, can agree to that pretty easily, that Rhino just handles geometry better. And so we see a lot in the early side of the design or in the early side of the process, teams utilizing Rhino for the big picture geometries, for building forms, for massing studies, for different things like that. And I would say, Bill, to kind of answer your question and maybe to kind of go full circle, it's not much unlike what Asan and I do with Python in mm -hmm. getting into the API and messing with the elements in that way or what we do with Dynamo and grabbing elements in that way and, and editing them or creating them or modifying them in, in some way. 
Um, so it's, it's really just about getting into the API and then what can we do with it? What does Autodesk allow us to right. do with it, right? And I think McNeil with Rhino Inside has really capitalized on that and allowed us to kind of come full circle, luckily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah. so yeah. that we can start to abandon some of those other programs which we won't mention. Well, and and <laughs> I think that I think that that too that that we're seeing, you know, you, you have this really granular control. I mean, it's not using like a file format. You know, the problem with file formats is that they take some things that you like, let's say the geometry, but then they strip off a lot of other organization or information you have, you know, and you've got to figure out how to get that in there some other way. Uh -huh. And, and so we're seeing we're seeing companies now. You know, they start with Rhino, and and then they you know they're and they're just pushing geometry in there. You know, let's say for the competition part, and then as the project continues on, you know, all of a sudden now the floors instead of being floors out of Rhino, their floors may be generated from the outline, but they're Revit floors now. And now Rhino is, you know, bringing the core in and maybe we're still working on the facade in Rhino. So, you know, as the project goes along, you know, the, the balance of, of, of the, you know, the canonical data, can, canonical data, I guess you could call it that, the, is, is um, can, can change based on where the project is. And, yeah. and, and so, you, you know, you're late in the, in the design development, you're still working on your facade, but your core and everything else is now completely in Revit. And, 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 you know, and now you're, you're bringing in a bunch of geometry from Revit so that when you model the facade in, in Rhino, it uh, can, you know, it's in the proper location. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're not, we're not converting anymore. No, I mean, no, we're, no. we're, we're having a, we're having the other tool draw it for us. We, we don't call it interoperability anymore. We call it integration. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a whole different way of thinking. It's a totally different way of thinking, and and yeah. and I tell you, it until Asan came on board, we were very confused walking around inside Revit, and so. Oh yeah. Yeah, we were. We. Uh, I think all of us are. <laughs> well, yeah, we're all still confused <laughs> we walking were all around lucky Revit. For Asan. Yeah, do we use the W A W S D keys or do we use the arrow keys? I mean, what do we use to walk? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, we went into a, a, a large architecture firm and we were showing them this and and they said, do you have levels? And and we looked at them and said, are levels uh -huh. important? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of where we were in the process. And and uh, and uh, yeah, it was pretty bad. I mean, yeah. in hindsight. Um, but right. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we've been working hard on trying to to do more and more and support more and more. And we're just scratching the surface. The, the possibilities yeah. here are, are crazy. When you look they at the- They are crazy. Um, yeah. Um, when you look at the big picture, um, sort of like from my standpoint that I kind of joined the project a little bit later, uh, when you look at the big picture, I see that what Rhino inside Revit really did was that a lot of like architecture firms, they already had Rhino as part of the schematic design process or as part of the like computational design process, a lot of people were generating like, you know, exterior designs and all that kind of stuff inside Rhino and Grasshopper. What Rhino inside Revit really did was that it sort of like connected Rhino and Revit much, much better together um, in the design process. So as you're done with stuff, they can start moving into the next step in the assembly line. And then can go inside Revit and get documented properly and get dimension and get huh. uh, put on sheets and all that kind of stuff, get the, uh, the real beam data sort of like injected into them, all that, all that kind of stuff. And then it, dis it doesn't disconnect, it doesn't remove Rhino from the process because it maintains its connection and integration with Revit. It stays along during the, during the uh, sort of like evolution of the project. So then later on uh, towards like construction, Rhino picks up all these geometries and all that kind of stuff again and generates documentation for fabrication because oh. that's the best platform you can, uh, you can generally use. And a, a lot of the fabricators and everybody else outside already use Rhino for fabricating um, uh, sort of like panels and all that kind of stuff right. in there. Yeah, when, they, when things get up to oh. LOD 400, 450, you know, the LOD gets really detailed for, and you know, therefore it's for yeah. a very specific sometimes for that one fabricator um that's that's when you know rhino because it's a geometry play you know how do we break the geometry down the lod 300 that we get out uh -huh. of the bim model 
and how do we break it down to actually drive our machines? And so isn't, that's, isn't that interesting how we use, use Rhino as your conceptual model, and then you, you take that data and have it draw in Revit, and then you go on Revit and create all your construction documents, and then you go right back to Rhino at the end of the project to create the details on how to actually build the thing. Yeah, for the part, especially for things that are going to need digital fabrication. Yeah. You're going to drive some some machine. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Could especially it, if you want to work with machine like on roll surfaces, that kind of stuff. Like Rhino is really great for, for fabrication. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, the, the simplest thing you could say is when you want geometry, you want to operate on geometry, that's when it's a really good time to look at Rhino inside Rivet. Yeah. It's, it, not vector works rhino yeah that's right <laughs> i think i think that's what i said yeah um, yeah. yeah that's um, a different conversation that's, right. that's a different that's right. conversation yeah and also you know remember too that all the grasshopper plugins all of them now run in revit yeah so all, all the plugins all the, yeah all the grasshopper plugins. all the great grasshopper plugins right right now and rhino plugins. plugins yeah and rhino a lot of plugins, plugins for that yeah yeah. Yeah. And I then you got all your Dynamo Revit. plugins. Dynamo plugins. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine getting yeah. Dynamo and Revit on the same screen working together as Dynamo one. And grasshopper, right? Dynamo yeah. And Dynamo grasshopper. and Grasshopper. Yeah. Actually, we did that. Yes, we did do that for fun. <laughs> we, and... uh, we created because Marcelo challenged us. Oh. Um, and he's like, well, can you do this? And we're like, yeah. I can. So we sort of like sketched out a Grasshopper component that uh -huh. takes the Dynamo definition asks Dynamo to run it and then grabs the results and continues. It's kind of like through. having a Dynamo cluster in Grasshopper. Wow. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and like Python, when you write Python, you can write the Python is intermixed, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's Revit and Rhino calls like intermixed, like they're actually work together because they are in the same memory space. They actually do work. I mean, it's not no trick. Yeah. Yeah. It's so inside. It's, it's inside. It's integration. This is integration. So. Are you are you finding, I can imagine that Rhino inside for the most part, people that are using Grasshopper, people that are using Rhino and that are forced to use Revit are finding, hey, this is great. Let's let It makes us do what we want. But are you finding that it's giving those people that are using Revit and having access to this now because, you know, the firms that have Rhino have that starting to say, hey, this is pretty cool. Maybe I will learn Rhino. Maybe I'll learn Grasshopper, you know, people coming from the other way over. I see yeah. a lot of head shake. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I would say what happens more often now is that there's a lot of, of internal talent that companies have that know Grasshopper because they learned it in school. And they don't know about it because those people have been using Revit. And, uh -huh. and now that Rhino inside Revit comes along, all of a sudden people pop up out of the woodwork and say, hey, I know Grasshopper. We can run it in Revit. And, and, and so it's, it's kind of reawakening that um, um, piece. And, and, it's, and it, what I love about it, um, when we first started this, you know, I always used to say that you know, you'd have your Rhino meeting in this room and you'd have your Revit meeting in that room. You know, if you've been people in that room and your designers in that room or whatever you want to call them, the, the geometry crazy people in that room and kind of nobody wanted to, to touch it. And now, you know, now because the tools are integrated together, they're actually in the same room and they are talking about the same workflow. Huh. Um, and so that's great. Unfortunately, there's still one sits on one side of the table and the other one sits on the other side of the table, but I, you know, I can't. Yeah, well, they're dogs and cats. They can't really yeah, play, play yeah, that. That's well. right. That's right. But, but they really are talking about the same workflow. And, and so it, it is, it, it's, I mean, it, it's been fun. I mean, we've never, you know, and all the time I've been doing this, we've never kind of had this shift in, in uh, tool sets. I mean, first of all, no CAD company, I don't think is crazy enough to integrate their product in somebody else's product. I think that was, you know, kind of yeah. nuts. I don't see Autodesk making Revit inside of Rhino. No, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. You really don't have to do that anymore. I mean, Rhino's inside right. Revit, but the, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And to, to be able to pull it apart, you know, with, mm -hmm. with one of our systems people did so they could so we could load rhino as a dll is was the kind of magic in the whole, yeah 
Yeah. It's magic. Yeah, Designing Grasshopper is actually like the interface for all these new components has been a, quite a big challenge for this specific reason. Because like me, I'm coming from Revit side. TK, he comes and Scott come from Rhino side. And there's always this back and forth between us because I want to take, um, I want to bring Rhino to Revit users. And Kike wants to bring Revit to Rhino users. Yes. So the two completely different points of view, different mm. approaches to uh, problem solving, or the way you see this data model sitting in front of you. Right. Uh, so that's also quite challenging. Just you know, where do you draw the line? Like who are who are who are we making this for? Yeah. I and and it puts it puts the weirdest pressure on Rhino that we've not seen before. Um, you know, for instance, yeah, where do we put all the data? We have all this data coming from Revit and, and we want to put it in the Rhino model because it needs to work with a plugin, let's say. You know, where do we stuff it? Where do we put that? And, and, and you know, there aren't always great places to put it. Um, or, and so you got to figure, figure that out. Or the, um, you know, uh, for instance, we support materials. We can create materials and edit materials with Grasshopper in Revit, right? So they're Revit render materials. We can't even do that in Rhino, and so <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. But <laughs> but you know, there's there's a lot of things that that actually that we're doing with Revit that now are coming back huh. and 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 changing the way Grasshopper works with Rhino. Um, That's interesting. It is. It's it's very. It's just it's cool. I mean, but it's definitely you know it's cross pollination and it's you know a joint influence and it, and and as we do this more and more. Um, you know, as we go along on this project, I can only imagine it's just going to get more and more integrated. So, well, I think I think uh, when we talk a few years from now, and I hope we do, uh, we're going to be looking back at this and go, "What the heck were we thinking? That is so rudimentary. Look at what we're doing today." Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, well, what were we thinking when we could have just done this? Or? Yeah, well, and you you were talking about just, you know, how, how right, what was the original way we used to talk between Rhino and Revit? We would take, uh, create an Excel spreadsheet of points, right? And we'd read yeah. that in with Dynamo, right? And then we'd, we'd have to figure that out. And, and so that's, this is an evolution yeah. of that. Yeah. It's amazing how exactly. Excel becomes the universal translator. Yeah. It's the, I read one uh, a place that a spreadsheet was the first computational design tool that was ever like created because technically, like, yeah, it's parametric. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the old days of running Lotus one, two, three and having to hit the button and waiting for it to actually compute all of the stuff. And then you go, oh no, I forgot to do this. Then you would do that. And then wait another minute or two for it to compute. And It'll Lotus was the, break. yeah. And yeah. Lotus was the fastest one out there. Lotus was the fastest <laughs> one out there, and and then we got a two eighty six, and we were really fast. Oh. <laughs> but Dana, I interrupted you. Love interrupting me and show your showing your age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dana. <laughs> your day will come. No, no. I, the, exactly the. I think that the opening up the door of the conversation, I think is just so important. I've always been the type of person to try to teach people massing tools and design tools natively within Revit because teaching them another program and another tab was just so difficult. But this, like you're saying, you guys really do, McNeil and, and Rhino and Grasshopper have a hold educationally. We see that regularly people in their portfolios coming out of college, coming into firms and knowing the software. And so if we can utilize that, that knowledge that already exists and marry the two, it just makes so much sense, right? Yeah. You can start to, to understand how we can create these workflows that seamlessly come together from beginning to end, from conception to, you know, construction. Yeah. We that's actively look at yeah. oh sorry go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. no um, I was gonna I was just gonna add, like we actively look at what the let's just you know for the lack of a better term call uh, call customers need uh, and in the workflows and challenges and stuff like that like just to give you an example the fact that we added the um, um, the material handling components in Grasshopper in Rhino in Sad Revit to be able to create and analyze Revit materials was primarily because uh, Dynamo was missing it. And we were like, well, if somebody wants to do this, let's prioritize this, create those, have a, a solution outside that people can use. 
So sort of like if you look at the spectrum of all the challenges that exist on, on top of Revit, let's say specifically, like we try to find the ones that uh, the holes in that spectrum and fill those first. Say, hey, like let's create something something that's um, sort of like helps the customers and solves their problems right now. And we'll add the add on to it as we go along. I think that's a that's a great mentality to, to fill in the holes. Um, I also think that Scott mentioned earlier about his his example that he shows people bringing in the the walkway as a site. I think that that might be a great way to segue and to put you both on the spot uh, as we are oh. doing video here. Uh, if somebody could pull up an example and we could show, we could not just talk about Rhino inside, but oh. we could show them Rhino inside. Is that why we're doing Zoom? That's right. <laughs> That is that, yeah, I guess I better do that, huh? So, yeah. All right. So let's, um, yeah, let me get, get zoom out of the way here. Let's see if this actually works. That'll be so, next rhino inside of zoom. Yeah, yes. that's right. That's right. I don't know what you would do with it, but you can do it. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, so I'm going to try to, I have to apologize. I'm going to attempt to, to run Revit here. Um, okay. So, Sounds much better at it than I am. Um, so you're, you're much better at presenting. I, I either talk way too fast or like skip over stuff. So the, the, this is so this is what you get when you when you install Rhino inside Revit is you get this tab here and before it's loaded, it's just going to have this one button. And once you hit this one button, then it loads Rhino and Grasshopper and Python and everything inside Revit. And so if it's successful, it'll give you this, this uh, uh, toolbar here, which you can edit or, you know, you can control some things. And so if we hit this, um, we get Rhino. And, and this is actually Rhino running in Revit. And Rhino knows it's running in Revit. Now, you don't have to show this interface, but in this case, it works well to, to, to figure out what we have. So this is a... a you know, just a, a complicated walkway. Um, you know, you can see it has some custom kind of beams in it and, and pieces. Um, and and what drives what drives the thinking sometimes is when you do this is it's it's not just the geometry, but it's how this is going to be built. And so in this case, you know, we have this custom walkway that we let's say it's going to be fabricated off site and brought out. And then, and then we have these foundational pieces, these little foundational footings that have to be built on site. So, so what we can do is I'll bring up Grasshopper. And, and because Grasshopper is running in Revit, now it knows that, for instance, that it has Revit aware components. So this is, these are components that only exist when, when Grasshopper is running in Revit. Or if I come over here, it has a whole new toolbar of things like here's how to build beams and columns and floors and how to deal with categories and how to deal with elements and families, create families and insert families and, and uh, how to deal with Revit materials. Um, walls are complicated enough. They have their own um, piece. So, so these are all pieces, you know, so anyway, Grasshopper knows where it's running and um, and then uh, let's just open a uh, uh, definition here. And uh, it'll sit here and cook a bit because I'm on Zoom. So it takes a little bit more processing power. But um, if you look at this, this is just a standard um, definition in, in Grasshopper. And you can see over here now that we have the, the model in Rhino and we have the model in uh, Revit. Uh, and, and let me kind of show how that's set up. So, so we use, I use something called Elefront, um, which is one of the plugins that you can get for free in Rhino. And um, it grabs all the geometry out of, uh, out of Rhino. And then coming up here, it filters the layer, the foundation layer. So everything that's on the foundation layer here is going to kind of get filtered into the system. And then it creates a, a family with all the, that geometry. And, and the family, you know, what's the category, uh, what's the template, uh, what's the, um, uh, the name, and, and then we can, we can toggle whether it's overwritable or not. So whether it updates constantly as, as Grasshopper changes or Rhino changes, or if, it, if it's more static. Um, then we grab a type, 
um, the type out of it. It's a component family, so it's one type. And then what we can do is we can insert that into Revit. And so we have, um, this is one family. Um, and, and so that's the footings. And that happens to be on um, structural foundations. So I put that in the structural foundations category. Uh, and then if you look at, um, if we come here and, and look at this bottom piece, this bottom piece actually is much more complicated because it has to take the, the columns and the, and the structure and the glass and all those pieces. So, so what we do is we have Grasshopper kind of select all those objects by layer. And then um, using key value searches, I can actually change, I can change layer names to what I want subcategories to be named. And so, so it's taking all that geometry and it's, it's taking the, it's changing the layer names to subcategories. It's, um, you know, in this case, it's going to put it on the site uh, uh, category. It's going to, these are going to be subcategories to site. And so um, it adds materials, it puts all the objects in here, it creates family forms that include their subcategory and then it creates a new, a new family called walkway. And off we go and we insert that. And so what we end up with now is we have a walkway in here and this could be, all these could be individual objects. I just am too lazy. So it's all one, one family inserted. Uh, but um, if you look at this, so now we have all these objects here but they are all subcategorized. And so it, you can come in and do um, look at graphics, uh, the graphic overrides, for instance, and you can edit uh, these, these subcategories. And then that information um, is, uh, that information, so here you can have canopy beams, canopy, those things, that information stays in. So when you create drawings, that's all in, uh, that's all in Revit, just like you normally would. And so uh, let's see here. Yeah, so you can see here that that now Revit's drawing this with different line weights and, and you know, it has the structural grid and, and all those pieces. And so, and as I edit the Rhino model, this actually will update this drawing. So that's the kind of integration you can get with this. So there's an elevation. And, and, and because it's all sab categorized, you, you have control over what each element looks like when it gets cut and all those things. The, you, one of the things we like to say is, you know, be nice to your BIM manager and use Rhino inside Revit so that you don't mess with the model too badly. That sounds right. like a t-shirt. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Do something nice for your BIM manager today. Yeah. Well, also right. the production team, right? The documentation team that's going to actually have to detail out these elements or edit them in some way to, you know, if they don't want to get into Rhino and actually modify them within Revit, they can actually do that, right? Mm -hmm. It's native Revit geometry that they can get into and, and modify. And that's the real beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then as they, as they edit those properties here, graphic properties here, updating geometry doesn't doesn't override those properties those that sticks and so yeah so. and and the model's a lot lighter because they're real revit objects exactly yeah, yeah. and you don't have that many of them because like for example um right. Scott said that he didn't split all these different components into individual like columns and stuff like that but i think it's actually good because the revit is not driving the geometry for this piece it's rhino right. So you don't really have to split them into like 20 different components, right? You only need to, you only need to split them if you need to split them. Exactly. If so you don't if need to count yeah. them like that later, then that would be a different, different. Yeah. Thing. Or split them later. Who cares? Yeah. 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 Because you can do that now. You don't have to take the old, take the Rhino model and dumb it down to something that Revit can understand or Revit can import, import yeah. that it's all one big blob, messy thing that takes forever to load and makes your, your model unhappy and your BIM manager unhappy. Can't have that. No, it can't, can't have a, can't have a, a, a very angry armadillo. <laughs> you, uh, yeah, this is great. And then as the model progresses or as the building progresses, you decide, okay, do I want to now take this geometry that's in Revit and take it further? Or do I want to go back to 
rhino where it came from and take it further and and break it apart a little bit more or modify it it's great right right and that and that's and that's and that's that's where the you know I, like uh we you know we answer a bunch of workflow questions here but but we also create probably five times more questions about workflow like yeah what, what, you know where how does this fit in the bim standard and you know, at what stage in the project do we do this, that, or the other thing, and and how does that, how do those interact with each other, and and mm -hmm. so those those are that's a that's a real, you know, that's a real question. Um, so yeah. this just to kind of take this further so that we can have some fun. Um, so this is a similar thing, except for what we're going to do now is create actual Revit families, uh, system families, and so you know this way in this case I'm grabbing these floors. And, and this is a good example where we're grabbing these, these just the curves here. We're just grabbing these curves and these curves have names on them. And so, so you know, in Rhino and, and that information can be encoded by the person that did the Rhino model. And, and we filter through that and Revit picks up on that. And in this case, it finds the elevation of each curve and it creates a level for each one of those floors. And then it turns right around and it um, creates the floors on hosted on those levels wow you guys do levels yeah yeah I, I, <laughs> I've, I've heard i've heard they're important um, and so um and i think they're these dashy line things over here yeah but, uh, so. yeah so but you can see like we're using you know standard grasshopper selectors except for they're selecting revit families you know and 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 so this is these are uh, you know these are floors and and so if you really want to edit this you know I, I'm gonna I'll edit I can edit it here uh, let's see if I can remember how to do all this uh, let's do oh it. just unpin it first yeah oh yeah you gotta unpin it that's, that's right. why it's locked yeah let's do this uh, there you go so we can edit boundary um, you know I can I can double click on on this huh. you know and yeah. And, and see, I get a dimension here, you know, and I can just edit that. Yeah, because uh -huh. it's a Revit object. It's a by, Revit object. So drawn if by Rhino. That's right. That's right. Now, I'm not going to save this because, of course, Grasshopper is trying to control this at exactly the same time, and it's going to overwrite it. But, right. you know, if you disconnected Grasshopper, you just told this to be orphanate, um, and then... Um, uh -huh. And then, it, yeah, you. It, I mean, nobody could tell this wasn't done in, in Revit in the first place. Um, right. And so, hmm. yeah, yeah. So instead of you trying to uh, trying to do a better import, you just taught Rhino how to do Revit. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We taught Grasshopper how to do Revit. You taught yeah. Grasshopper how to yeah, do Revit. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's that's this is the the key piece, and you know it can do some fun things like like uh, drive uh, uh, um, drive adaptive components. So. So you know, it's it's it, we gridded out a, a weird a weird shape over here, and um, and then and then we're driving all the adaptive components, and those are standard uh, Revit adaptive components. You can see that here, um, but but you you know, Grasshopper can choose pick and choose where different components go where. So you can have you can have Grasshopper be smart. You know, this is a random pattern. Um, but you could have grasshopper be smart on the edges, do one thing and the middle do a different thing. And if the uh -huh. angle gets greater than that, do something else. And you can see that the Revit objects are previewing in the Rhino model. Look at that. So it's, it's like, it's, it's just fun. I, it's just been fun. To, so to uh, uh, it looks really cool. And I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, with Revit, and the, the generative design, how you get that now with uh, Revit 2021 and 2022, it ties into Dynamo and it comes with some stuff on the back end to do generative design. What the things that you're showing is here, when you get a uh, Rhino inside of Revit, do some of these grasshopper uh, graphs come with it or does everything start from scratch? You get the interface and then the, the user has to create all of these, uh, these graphs or scripts that are running in grasshopper. Um, so grasshopper is, is, so the way you, it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like dynamo. The way you run dynamo is that you create a definition and you start throwing components on and uh, doing your own logic. 
we have a lot of examples on the wiki for how things are sort of like done. Um, and we have approached it very systematically. Like for example, if you go onto, onto the wiki, there's a category for, um, there's a, a guide for floors, for example, and it, it explains how floors work in Revit and how you can uh, um, sort of like query and modify and that kind of stuff, right? So we have it on the side, on the side like walls is one of the good examples that's fairly, um, fairly advanced and sort of like, so we have examples of like how you can chain components and do different things with it. Gotcha. Um, it doesn't come pre-built with a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, but it gives you the uh, stuff like the programming environment to do all you want. Um, as far as the generative design goes, um, Grasshopper is actually the first application that implemented um, a sort of like that kind of an environment into it. So Grasshopper comes with Galapagos, which is a generative solver. Um, and you can um, um, sort of like use that to create your own challenge, the network, the, uh, the, hard, uh, the sort of like the graph that you create. And you pick and choose the parts of the graph that are your variables inside your um, inside model, and then you connect those to Galapagos, and you pick the solver that you want, and it starts going through the different options and solve it. But you don't necessarily have to do this over Revit. You can do all the solving because it's sort of like part of the design. You can do it just outside of the Revit inside Rhino, or you can uh, Rhino gives you Rhino and Grasshopper have this component called Hops, which is fairly new, and it gives you the ability to run your uh, data modeling applications, uh, analysis, that kind of stuff outside in a C Python application. Sure. So sort of like just just for by, by having Grasshopper, it gives you this amazing connection to everything else that's uh, that's out there to uh, expand the tool chain that you have. Yeah, and, and I think you you answered the question with with the first part. Um, I wasn't necessarily asking if Grasshopper could do generative design, but more about okay. the, that that add in that comes with Revit is run off Dynamo when it comes with some some example oh, graphs. Right. And so you answered that there that rather than having a bunch of sample, uh, are they called graphs or scripts? What, what do you call a, a Grasshopper program that you run? Definitions. Uh, I can, yeah, definitions. I can call them definitions too. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so instead of coming with a bunch of grasshopper definitions, you guys have a very built out, or it looks like a very robust uh, primer or wiki that sort of walks you through the process. And so rather than giving them the fish, you're teaching them how to fish, which I, which I think is a great way to go. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have, got, we have gotten this, this compliment that I, I quite love is that um, somebody looked at the Rhino Inside Revit wiki and they're like, well, if I wanna learn Revit, I'd really need to look at the Rhino Inside Revit wiki. <laughs> Because um, there's just a lot of the whole lot of information about the internals of how Revit works, which like normal Revit users generally don't have to don't have to know. But once you get into development, you kind of need to. I like that. I'm writing that down. That's another shirt. And learn <laughs> Revit. Get got lots of shirts. Yeah. And 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 I think I'm it's. Sure I never got one. I know. Yeah. I, I saw that you didn't yeah, have much for I'm sure. <laughs> Or else I'd be wearing it. I wasn't right going to say anything. That's right. Um, <laughs> I'll take the blame for that one. I, I think that I think too that that it's important to understand that that Grasshopper is not just it's not just you know one method of doing you know whatever the the met optimization method you have. So you know Design Explorer or or generative design on the Autodesk side. That's you know we call that optioneering. And Galapagos is an evolutionary solver. And, uh, you know, OWL does a certain kind of machine learning. And, you know, Millipede does a different kind of learning. And Panda is a different kind of, of, of uh, optimization. And so one of the things that, that's happened is that, you know, all of these optimization tools that are available and used in lots of different places are now available in Revit. So you have you know, what kind of optimization do you want to do is really the question. Um, and, and it's just, you know, it's limitless, it seems like. And, and it really does seem that the, uh, um, the Zoom members, um, I guess these would be akin to packages in, in Dynamo. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And we call them packages too. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> see, I need to learn pages. a lot about Grasshopper. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can sort of see that the product that you use and what it's really good at is where they, they spend their time developing them. A lot of the packages that we use in uh, Dynamo are great for the production stuff, the automation yeah. stuff, the, the stuff that all of us geeky people do that work in the production and want to make our life easier. And we can yeah. see that all the really cool stuff that comes with the facade, the energy analysis, no ladybug, all those great things that you can do there, yeah. how they come with that. And now that we can bring the two together, it's it's literally the best of both worlds. Yeah. 
Yep. And they, and they both have players, you know, so you can, you know, just like use Dynamo player, Grasshopper as Grasshopper player for Revit, um, you know, and, and uh, PyRevit, PyRevit supports both, both script types. So you can have it share the interface together. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, yeah, we're hoping that everybody can become a little bit more bilingual, I guess. Nice. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah. So Dana, we're, we're, we're dangerously close to the bottom of the hour. I'm going to give you final thought. Oh. Well, I guess the final thought I want to ask Scott and Hassan, what, what tomorrow brings, what's next? Right. When, when we have that conversation in two years, you can like, we kind of forecasted that. Right. Any of those thoughts, maybe that we can. Um, I, well, safe harbor we... speech here. Yeah, no safe kidding. <laughs> yeah. Let me get um, my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing that's really exciting, especially like I'm, I'm super excited about this, is that we are working really hard towards version one of official version one of Rhino Inside, Rhino Inside Revit. And um, Rhino Inside Revit will finally have a piece, a piece of technology that we call, we were, we're tentatively calling it element tracking. And that means that Grasshopper will remember and manage all the components that it creates inside Revit. And it's just like magic. Like, like if you are using Grasshopper on Rhino, that's what it's going to feel like when it's working on Revit. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, it's actually, yeah, see, it's actually better than how it works in Rhino, but um, <laughs> that's yeah, yet another one of those embarrassing things. All that kind that's of right. Stuff, yeah. that's right. um, so this is what we're excited for. And this has been a bottleneck throughout the development because we kind of needed that piece of technology to be able to expand and start creating uh, what I tend to call create components that can generate more of the Revit stuff. Like we have floors and beams and all that kind of stuff. But up to this point, it was really tricky because like if you disconnect it, if you reopen the model, it might regenerate or duplicate the, con the components that it was creating again. But with this, it'll pick up the previous ones that he has created, no problem. And now we can really start creating um, component, uh, uh, relevant components for it. Like for example, one of the things that I really wanted to after the, this first version comes in right after is to start developing a series of components for automate, uh, automate, automate, uh, automating documentation in Revit creating sheets, views, legends, placing them all over the place, um, that kind of stuff. Um, so you can sort of like, we can automate the documentation process as much as we can inside Revit using Rhino Insight. Right. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so after element tracking comes out, um, which is, yeah, like Hassan said, is a big one, um, you know, looking further in the future, uh, you know, as the Revit API gets better, which Autodesk continues to improve, every version, um, you know, we just keep chasing that, right? We just keep going to just keep adding and, and keep adding components more and more and more and more. I mean, it's a, it's really just a, a big thing. And yeah. I mean, 2022 came out with the ability to make holes in the floors, for instance, um, and we'll be able to support that um, as we move forward. Well, I'm excited to see what's coming along. I'm excited to see what you already have. What you already have is great sure which coming along is going to be even better and uh, one last thought I'd like to leave with all the bin managers out there is don't let your standards uh, stunt your growth look out a little bit and look at tools like this and uh, learn about them because this is what's coming it's it's not it's not a fad this is the new the new rabbit so thank you very much for joining us today on BIM Thoughts. Yeah, thank you. We had a great time. Yeah, no, so, it's a lot of fun. We should yeah. do it soon. We should do it sooner than later. We will. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I'll have my people talk to your people. That's right. <laughs> well. oh.